I would like now to introduce our third speaker, and I'm very pleased to do that. It's Professor Graham Machen. Hello, John. <laughs> he is from uh, NPL, and uh, he's going to talk to us about evolution of temperature measurements, beginning, progress, and prospect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Okay, well, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, between you and lunch, I won't uh, hopefully keep the time today. I'll only be an hour or so, so don't worry too much. Uh, just a few words about the National Physical Laboratory, in case you've never heard of it. Uh, the National Physical Laboratory was founded in 1900, and it's where all of the national standard, physical national standards are established, like the kilogram, the meter, the Kelvin, and so forth. So if you uh, wonder how reliable measurement happens, and you should wonder how reliable measurement happens in the UK or elsewhere, it all starts in the National Physical Laboratory in, in Teddington. So I just want to, since this is about living things, uh, and I'm going to talk about temperature most of the time, I thought it would just be worth just reminding ourselves why temperature and living things are important. So first, the Earth, of course, is in a, a very... Um, almost like a Goldilocks position in the solar system where there's lots of liquid water. If it was in a different part or the Earth in a different part of the solar system, there'd be no living water, no, no liquid water, and there'd be no life. So, for instance, Venus, which is one of our near neighbours, you'd think would also uh, be quite a nice place to live. It's a bit warmer. Actually, there's no liquid water on, on Venus. The surface of Venus is so hot, you'd melt lead if you actually were on the surface. And it's actually got runaway greenhouse uh, effect happening. So the surface of Venus is getting hotter and hotter all of the time. So not a pli nice place to visit, let alone to live. In fact, satellites uh, and probes find it very hard even to get near the surface of Venus because it's so horrible uh, to get there. And then the other, other one, the other extreme is Mars. Again, Mars uh, is the average temperature on the surface of Mars is minus 60, which means at least half the temperatures measured are less than minus 60. That's quite cold. Not much can live at minus 60, uh, but also there's no liquid water, as far as we can tell, and there's almost no atmosphere as well. So Mars is, is deep frozen uh, and uh, no complex life living on Mars, despite what science fiction writers might tell us. I was reading a, uh, I'm writing a talk on Lord Kelvin at the moment, and apparently Lord Kelvin appears in a science fiction book in the 1890s, and he saved the world from the Martian invasion. But... Uh, I don't know how we managed to do that since there were no Martians to, uh, to save us from. But uh, life is amazing, isn't it? It's adapted and can uh, live in very cold parts where you do sometimes see temperatures below minus 60 uh, to very warm parts as well. Uh, so life is adapted to live in that band between minus 60, minus 70 to maybe 50 or 60 or degrees, but certainly not above 100 because we'd all boil away above 100, wouldn't we? And of course, crops, we're all dependent on our food, and crop yield depends on temperature, and also the type of crops you grow depends on the temperatures you achieve as well. And of course, human health and health in general uh, is uh, monitored using temperature. You've all, you've all probably got measured by a forehead thermometer during the COVID pandemic. The answer was completely wrong, OK? It was completely wrong. You throw your forehead thermometer. If you've got a forehead thermometer, throw it in the bin. That's the best place for it. Um, sorry to uh, say that. Of course, uh, in, even at the cellular level, temperature drives uh, cell uh, activities in cells as well. So temperature is very important. So it's really surprising, in fact, given that temperature is really an essential measurement quantity, vital for health, vital for life. <laughs> but in fact, reliable temperature measurements only really began about 200 years ago. And really understanding what temperature meant only really happened about 150, 170 years ago, which is really surprising when you think about it. And actually, even today, you know, temperature measurement is so commonplace, you take it for granted. In your homes, there are probably 10 or 20 thermometers, which you probably didn't even know about, controlling your ovens and your washing machines and your boilers and so forth. So temperature measurement is ubiquitous, and yet it's, so, it's such a surprising thing. So here's how I'm going to go in my talk. I'm going to talk about how it started in the late 1500s uh, to the 1800s, that's the first block, then what it really meant from the 1850s and how reliable temperature measurement emerged, uh, linked to true temperatures uh, till now, and then what might happen in the future as well. 
hopefully all in the next 25 minutes. I'll do my best. So let's talk about thermoscope, then true thermometers, how they emerged, and then the emergence of uh, the temperature scales as well. And how do you introduce the thermoscope? Well, you do it by going to Florence. Okay, so Florence is a very, it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very beautiful place. I hope you've been to Florence. Um, uh, you go to the Uffizi Art Gallery. Um, you go to uh, Santa Maria di Fiori. You go to the Ponte Vecchia. Uh, I remember having uh, lunch in the, the Uffizi, looking over. It's wonderful. But actually, the best thing about Florence is it's got this wonderful museum, uh, uh, Galileo Museum, and it's so wonderful because it's got one of the world's best collections of thermometers. So if you're interested in temperature measurement. <laughs> Go to Florence. It's just a wonderful place to go and visit. Uh, it's got rooms full of historic thermometers. I tell you, well, I don't know why we, me and my wife bothered going to the Uffizi. The Galileo Museum was much, much better. Okay, so and the other reason, of course, you go to Florence is, of course, is where Galileo did a lot of his work. And although he didn't invent the thermoscope, uh, he reinvented, as it were, the thermoscope. Now, the thermoscope is really a, a primitive... Um, temperature measurement, temperature device, it's not really a thermometer. This is a picture uh, uh, from the, Mu the Galileo Museum of a thermoscope. It's a very simple device. There's a, there's a um, container of liquid, water, there's a thin glass column, and there's a bulb at the top. If you put your hand on the bulb, it warms up, the air expands, and it forces the liquid down. So that tells you it reacts to temperature. If you then add a scale, and we'll talk about scales a lot, so until you get really bored about them, we'll talk about scales a lot in the, in the next few minutes, then you, it becomes a true thermometer. Um, you need two reference points for a scale. So this uh, person, Santorio, he actually wrote about how he set up a scale. He applied snow, which isn't a fixed point, but he, applied, he tried. He applied the snow to the top of the sphere. The water went down as far as it, 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 it uh, sorry, came up sorry, as far as it, it would. And then that was the upper limit. And then he put a candle on it. And the water went down as the air expanded. And the, then he drew a line between the two. And that was his scale. Of course, it wasn't based on fixed points. But, but we'll talk about those in a few minutes. Of course, thermometers based on thermoscopes had a number of flaws. They were sensitive to air pressure, because obviously they were open to air. And of course, the liquid would go up and down because of air pressure. And of course, water is an amazing substance, uh, and we're all here because water is a, such an amazing substance. It has a maximum density at four degrees, which is why ice floats on the top of rivers and ponds and so forth and doesn't freeze from the bottom. Uh, so, so you can't really use it as, prop as a thermometer properly, which is why alcohol was actually introduced quite quickly as a thermometric substance. Uh, and sealing the tubes was a really key issue to actually get rid of the air pressure effect as well. And it seems that uh, this Grand Duke of Tuscany in 1654 started making thermometers like this. In fact, he was a much better, uh, apparently much better th scientist than he was a, a ruler, but that's another question. You have to ask his subjects about that. And very quickly, the Florentines made very elaborate uh, uh, and were very good uh, thermometers. So here's a, another picture from the Galileo Museum of a, a, um, a liquid, in, a li an alcohol in glass thermometer. There's a large amount of alcohol. There's 420 uh, scale markers. The liquid went up and down, went up now as the temperature uh, went up. They had two fixed points. Again, they were not real fixed points, but they tried. They used snow for the lowest. And of course, snow could have any temperature below the freezing point of water. And the hottest day in Florence, it can get very hot in Florence. But the hottest day does change over time. But that's the, that's the uh, scale they used. And then, of course, um, many scales emerged over time as people made thermometers. They wanted to calibrate them. And so they, they started uh, using alcohol, but they also started using mercury as well, because mercury gave you a wider range in which you could use them. Uh, but um, Hasek Chang, who's written a book on this, said by the late 17th century, that's the end of the 1690s or so, uh, thermometers were very fashionable. Everyone had to have a thermometer. If you go around stately homes, you'll see lots of thermometers. Um, but they're notoriously unstandardized. And that's because the, there were no agreed fixed points and no agreed temperatures. So people really made it up. So here's a nice picture for, just from the uh, History of Science Museum, just down the road of a Royal Society scale uh, thermometer. And this is an inverted scale. So at high temperatures, it has low, low numbers. So it's very hot. Here you see it at 5 degrees. And at freezing, it's at 65 degrees. 
So it's a, an inverted scale. You can go and see that down, just down the road. Don't go to after my talk. I know you're really keen to see it, but just wait till I've given it. Uh, and here's an even one. You've got to travel a bit further. This is in the University of Museum in Utrecht. Uh, but this has got 18 scales on it, just to show you that there was a wide range uh, of scales in use by the time of the mid-1700s. And this is like a conversion table. It's a real formator uh, as well. Uh, but the scale, so you can see the scale, the reason why there were so many scales is because they used a variety of so-called fixed points, and eventually they became fixed by convention. So there was the, the melting point of ice and the boiling point of water. They were re reg regularly used. Human body temperature, that was regularly used as well. But there were other strange ones, like freezing aniseed oil, like melting butter, like the temperature of a deep cellar in Paris. All sorts of strange things were used to, to calibrate uh, thermometers. So all those things happened, but, but by the beginning of the 19th century, about 1800 or so, a lot of those strange scales that were used drifted away. And three main ones uh, really came into play, all of them uh, invented in the first half of the 18th century. Uh, they're, they're, I'll call them de facto scales because they're the ones that are used, in fact, by people. The first one was uh, by Daniel Fahrenheit. Uh, he used mercury in his thermometers. He had this strange formulation of how to calibrate his thermometer. I think he was uh, protecting his IP because, in fact, this, this is a nonsense. If you read the paper, this is what it says to do. It gives you different answers if you use sea salt or ammonium chloride. So he was, he was just, I don't know how he got this through the refereeing process. I just don't know. But, but anyway, he, um, he, used, he defined the human body temperature as 96. Uh, ice and water mixture, very important. That is the actual melting point of ice. So, he, so he's very clear there. And of course, today, the Fahrenheit scale uh, which has no official status, but the Fahrenheit scale has water freezing at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and the boiling point at, uh, of water at uh, 212 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so another, another one was the Muir scale. A uh, very, very famous scientist, French scientist in the uh, 1700s. Very, a polymath. He, he wrote huge amounts about lots of things. Uh, and he also was very, very obscure about what he meant uh, I don't, I've read this, I don't know, maybe someone can explain it to me afterwards, but an evaluation of the expansivity of the thermometric liquid up to, and when it has just stopped boiling at what he called 80 degrees, being a number convenient for divide. I don't really quite understand what he's talking about when you read the paper, but actually I, I'm in good company. Most people didn't understand what he was talking about either. <laughs> and in fact, people just thought, oh, he's saying that 80 degrees remur is the boiling point of water, so that's what we'll use. And we won't worry about the philosophy that he was talking about. And this scale became very widely used uh, in Europe in the 18th and 19th century. And then finally, one which, uh, again, you're probably reasonably familiar with is the centigrade scale, uh, invented by um, this Swedish astronomer, Anders Celsius. Uh, he used mercury from the beginning in his thermometers, so that was a, a good step for him. Uh, he used an inverted scale, though, so the boiling point of water was 0 degrees Celsius, and the melting point of snow or ice was 100 degrees uh, centigrade, sorry. So that was an inverted scale. And uh, people realized, and they were too polite to tell him to such a famous person, that's a really bonkers way of measuring temperature. <laughs> so just after he died, people swapped it round. Uh, uh, this is true, by the way, I'm not making it up. <laughs> uh, and Linnaeus, for instance, the famous botanist, uh, then uh, said, no, 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 100 degrees is the boiling point, naught degrees is the uh, freezing point of water, and the, the centigrade scale was used thereafter. In fact, the unit of the, de the degree Celsius is the temperature unit that's used uh, today, along with the Kelvin. Here's just a nice picture of a, an ancient thermometer. Okay, I annoy my wife going around at Staley Homes taking pictures of thermometers, but, but bear with me, all right? So here's a, a so I don't know where I took this picture, but this is a, a uh, thermometer with Fahrenheit and Remur scale, so you can see Fahrenheit at 212 and at 80 Remur, and the freezing point over here as well at 0 Remur and 32 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> so uh, by the beginning of the 19th century, these three scales were the ones that were mainly in use. The Fahrenheit scale, the Remur scale, and the centigrade scale. But they were all, again, arbitrary. 
you see that the Fahrenheit scale temperatures didn't agree with the Rimmer scale temperatures, which didn't agree with the centigrade temperature scales. But uh, manufacturing improved. The, temperature, the thermometers got better. They got more reproducible. But the temperatures didn't have any physical significance. So what I want to really talk about now in the next part of my talk is really how physical understanding of what temperature was emerged, uh, primary thermometry, I'll explain what that means as well, and then how uh, it moved at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century from establishing pragmatic temperature measurement, where you can get temperature measurement which is close to what fundamental temperature says but done in a very simple way. So we'll just, just go back a bit. So Amonton, a very famous French physicist, and, and uh, Boyle, uh, here in, the, in uh, England at the time, he uh, developed this physical principle of the pressure times volume, beloved of A-level physicists, physics students, pressure times volume uh, is a constant. Uh, and that was a very important principle to be established. Uh, Amonton uh, developed an air thermometer, in, um, and it was later sealed in the... Uh, in the early 1700s. So he was, he was working with air thermometers very early on. So he just trapped air in here. It had to be dry air, or you get different answers with moist air. Uh, you have a mercury column. If you warmed up this bulb, of course, the mercury would go up. You just need to add a scale, and you have a thermometer. You just need to put a, turn it into a siphon, seal the end, and then you have a, a, a really good thermometer, which isn't sensitive to air pressure. <clears throat> The um, uh, amazing experimentalist Renner uh, in, uh, about 18, in the 1840s was given a massive grant by the French government to uh, try and uh, understand how to make steam engines more efficient so that they could beat the, beat the British uh, in industry. So he was given a massive amount of money and he did a, an amazing amount of work on understanding thermometry, fundamental thermometry, but he was very much an experimentalist, not a theoretician. Uh, and interestingly, William Thompson, who later became Lord Kelvin, went to work with him just for a few months. And it was uh, well, while he was working with him that uh, some of the principles of thermodynamics came into Thompson's mind and building on the experimental results that uh, Henri Jürgener uh, actually developed. So it was really uh, a very fortuitous meeting of minds. So here's William Thompson. I do wish I could grow a beard like that. Maybe when I get older, I'll be able to. William Thompson. Actually, is, is, uh, I'm giving a talk on William Thompson in a few, a few months' time as well. He, he, he's the, probably one of the greatest 19th century uh, scientists, I, I would say. An amazing person, but I won't get distracted talking about him now. Uh, William Thompson, he collaborated with a, a brewer, uh, James Jewell, who was very interested in heat and, 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 uh, and work, steam engines again. And between them, particularly when Thompson was working with Jewell, they brought together some important concepts which developed fundamental thermometry. And these key concepts uh, were really around how do you make a steam engine eff eff most efficient? And uh, they were using this, what's known as a, a Carnot heat engine, which is basically the, the cycle that a, a steam engine or a, a heat engine goes around. As a piston. You can imagine a piston going through its whole cycle, or there are different steps in that and different physics involved in that. Uh, and that's what the Carnot cycle effectively talks about. Uh, but though out of that, these key ideas that Kelvin brought together were that... Uh, you could, get, you could actually develop a temperature scale that's independent of substance, and that's really important. You don't have to have glass, you don't have to have mercury, you don't have to have alcohol. You don't, you can, it's independent of substance. It's a fundamental thing. He also accepted something, idea, which uh, all the way back, dated all the way back to Amontons, the absolute zero existed. There is a point when you can get zero pressure. Imagine gas in our own modern thinking. Um, gas, press, gas pressure is caused by atomic motion. <clears throat> if you cool it down, uh, the pressure gets less because the, gas, because the particle motion gets slower. If you keep cooling it down until the particle motion stops, that's when absolute zero actually occurs, when no particles, there's no pressure. So that concept became embedded. And I think really one of the most important was that uh, the conservation of energy became established. Up to that time, people didn't really believe in the conservation of energy. They, they thought that he was transferred by a, an in, a strange substance called caloric. But no, 
The work that Jewel, the work that Jewel did showed that heat and work were, were convertible, uh, so you could turn heat and make a piston move, turn it into work, or you could take a piston and compress and turn it into heat, but the energy involved in that process is conserved, depending whether it's mechanical or whether it's, whether it's heating. So uh, that was a very important discovery as well. And on that, Kelvin drew, the, drew those stems together and developed what's known as thermodynamic geometry. And so there are a lot of physical equations, and I'm not going to show you them all, because there are lots of them, where you basically have a relationship between, for instance, pressure and volume, or something, and temperature. So here, this simple, very simple A-level equation, I don't want to go beyond that. Uh, pressure times volume, Boyle's law, is equal to the amount of gas. R is basically the Avogadro number, the number of particles in a mole, and K, the Boltzmann constant, which I'll come back to a little bit later, which is a physical constant, multiplied by temperature, which is proportional to the quantity of heat, as everyone knows. Uh, so we still use uh, gas thermometers at MPL. Here's a, a picture of the MPL current gas thermometer. Uh, it measures the speed of sound in argon, and it's a very exquisite and beautiful apparatus, very, very accurate, but very impractical, OK? And this is the problem with, with primary thermometry. It's very impractical. It takes one week to measure a temperature. It requires a, a large amount of apparatus. It requires very expert research scientists to take a measurement and interpret it. It's not a practical thermometer. So you can't, so you can't really stick this in your industrial process and measure temperatures, which is a real problem because people wanted to do that. People wanted to measure temperature uh, traceable back to those physical principles, but to make it simpler as well. Very, very difficult to do. So how do you square that circle? How do you have a thermometers that tell you what true temperature is related to physical principles, but don't have to use a, a physical thermometer? Well, that was done. Oops, I've gone one too many. That was done by using primary thermometers, like those gas thermometers, to measure real fixed points, like the melting point of tin or zinc or water or whatever. And, and measuring their temperatures and saying, this is the true temperature according to physics. And then having a practical thermometer, known as a resistance thermometer that's usually used, which can measure the resistance at these fixed points. Then you fit a curve, and then you can develop a scale which is close to the fundamental physical scale, but is much easier to use because you have a practical thermometer to use. And I'm going to skip over that one because we're going to Hugh Longbourn Calendar, who really promoted uh, using the resistance of platinum wire, uh, which has used ever since, ever since he promoted that for realizing temperature and measuring temperature as well. You just have a platinum coil. I think I've got a picture of one in a minute. I'll come back to that in a minute. I've gone too far. And it's not going back for some reason. There we go. So if you can just see, there's a platinum coil here. Uh, and that was the, the foundation of the actual scale itself. So Hugh Longbourn Calendar developed a platinum thermometer. Uh, and his work uh, and uh, the work of others led to known as the International Temperature Scale of 1927. And this was the first temperature scale that was established. Uh, it was established from all the way down to minus 190 degrees C up to 660 degrees C. And other thermometers were used as well. But they just were the, the, they're just the same, uh, even with more modern ones. And they, it was revised in 1948, 1968. And the scale that's in use today is the International Temp Scale of 1990. Now, these aren't, temp, these aren't fundamental. They are known as T90. But they are linked to fundamental temperatures. And the temperatures that the scale gives uh, is very close to what you, you would get from a fundamental physical equation, but is very, very simple to get compared to using a primary thermometer. <clears throat> so these, you can't really read these, but these are the fixed points that are used to set up the ITS-90 now. These temperatures have been measured using primary thermometry. For instance, uh, if you, the, the uh, melting point of gallium is 429.7485 Kelvin. That's very, very precise. 
And let me just show you a picture. So this is a, a modern thermometer, platinum resistance thermometer. That's the sensing element. This is a, a zinc point, cut in half. We don't use it anymore. But you can see the metal zinc. And you can see a graphite crucible. These are placed in furnaces. You melt the zinc, so you turn it to about 400 and, sorry, 200, um, tin, sorry, it's tin, 232 or 233 uh, degrees uh, Celsius or so. And then you freeze the zinc, sorry, the tin. I don't know, I've got zinc in my head today. Uh, tin. And here you see uh, the resistance thermometer measuring the freezing point of the tin. But what you're really doing is measuring the resistance of that thermometer at the tin point. And then if you measure it at, say, at the zinc point and the water triple point, you then have three points which you can then fit a curve and know that the temperature's all the way in between. And that's how temperatures are all measured today. So what do we do now? So we've got uh, an amazing change. I and mean, we've got from where there was no measurement of temperature or no understanding of temperature to really understanding what temperature was through the work of William Thompson um, and, a few, and others as well. Uh, we've worked out how to relate to primary thermometry to practical thermometry to give you real temperatures uh, in your industrial processes, in your homes, in weather forecasting and so forth. But what can we do now? It, can you actually take some of those thermodynamic approaches and turn them into practical thermometers and so you can really measure thermodynamic temperature where you actually need it. Well, I, you can, in fact, if I can move this on. There we go. So, <clears throat> so I just wanted to say a few words in the last part of my talk about the Kelvin redefinition and the emergence of practical primary thermometry. So in 2019, the international system of units was redefined, uh, a really wholesale redefinition. I was privileged to, to be there and take part. Um, and the international system of units are now all based on a, a defined constants. I'll show you what it is for the temperature one in a minute. The um, speed of light uh, defines the meter. Uh, the Planck constant defines the kilogram. The elementary charge defines the ampere. The Boltzmann constant defines the Kelvin. The Avogadro number defines the mole. A uh, hyperfine transition of cesium defines the second. And there's a conventional constant to which does the candela. So the SI is artifact free and it uh, is really based on fundamental constants. So this is the uh, definition, the old definition of the Kelvin. It was based on a, a, prop, a proposal by Lord Kelvin in the 1800s, but was adopted in 1954. Uh, but the new definition of the Kelvin is based on a fixed value of the Boltzmann constant, which is this number, uh, which was measured in my lab and a few other labs around the world before it was defined. So this will never be measured anymore. It's, this is the, the value of the Boltzmann constant. And I think the important thing to see about the Boltzmann constant is as units of joules Kelvin, joules per Kelvin. It's a proportionality constant between energy, which is the fundamental quantity, and temperature, which is a really key, key thing. So what do we do then? So we have temperature sensors. We calibrate them. You use them. They drift. You have to calibrate them again. Can we move away from that situation? Can we have sensors that you can use uh, and they always give you the real temperature, the right temperature, uh, all of the time. And we were doing some work on that. So I'll just show you some work we're doing in my lab uh, at the moment and some university colleagues as well. Uh, just three different approaches. One is uh, known as Johnson noise. So I think this is the only other equation. So I'm sorry about that. I was meant to delete it before I, I, I put this talk up. But anyway, this is Johnson noise dormitory. So oh, some of us are a certain age. When you turned a radio on, it used to go, Sss. do you remember, do you remember that? You turn the radio on, it used to go, Sss. That, that was partly due to the Johnson noise that was in the electronics in the circuit. Um, told you it was alive. I don't like your digital radio, you didn't you switch on, nothing happens until you turn the volume up. Turn it on, it hissed. So that's due to the Johnson noise. Y you can measure the Johnson noise. That's what this equation is here, the mean square Johnson noise. And it's related very simply to these constants, the resistance of a resistor, the bandwidth of the, elect the electronic bandwidth, and the temperature. So if you can measure the mean square noise, you can measure the temperature. And uh, that's one way of actually developing a device using modern electronics to actually measure temperature. But, so one of my colleagues is working on that. One, but I'm, tell you, I'm going to tell you about some of the optical ones I'm working on. So in your, in your mobile phone, 
uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, microchips. And you may have noticed when you, when you use your mobile phone to play games, well, I, I never do that, but watch movies, oh, I never do that either. But when you, when you do that, it gets warm, doesn't it? It gets warm. Well, it gets warm because of all the CPU power that's being used to do the processing. And they, they limit the temperature that the chip gets to. Because if it gets too hot, the chip gets damaged, and then the, the, the device is ruined. <clears throat> Which mean, but they don't do the thermometry properly, so it means they always give you a large margin of error. So what I'm working on uh, with a colleague in the University of Glasgow is actually uh, working on how to microfabricate thermodynamic thermometers on chips so they can <laughs> give you the temperature of the chip in real time and the real temperature for the lifetime of the device using a quantum mechanical effect. So you have a, a ring. This ring is about a hundredth the diameter of your hair. OK, so you can't see it. So it's a hundredth diameter of your hair. You have a ring. You activate it with a, a laser. Uh, when you get the laser frequency right, the quantum mechanical tunneling happens, and you set up by effervescent waves. And you set up a resonance in an adjacent ring. This, is the, this ring is the thermometer, right? So when the temperature of the chip goes up, the ring diameter expands, and the frequency of the resonance changes. Just like a tuning fork, if you change the temperature of a tuning fork, the frequency changes. So the frequency of the resonance changes. And then you can measure the temperature of the chip by measuring the frequency change of that uh, ring. So we're just working out how to do that uh, really in the next few years. And we've just started microfabricating those. <clears throat> the other one is uh, using Doppler broadenings. If you shine uh, a laser light through uh, a uh, little glass cell, and it can be a really tiny glass cell, you can see microfabricated cells here, uh, and you have the right frequency, uh, it has a, you have a spectral line, and from the width of the line, you can actually determine the temperature of the gas within the little cell. And you can make these really, really small as well. So you can actually turn this into a practical thermometer. But the really nice things about those, both of these is they're based on fundamental physics. They don't need calibrating. You'll just be able to put them in your process, put them in your whatever needs to be done. Uh, and they'll always give you the right answer all of the time. So that's really taking the Kelvin definition and applying physics to get proper th physical thermometers, not ones that are that big and take a week but which will give you temperatures in the real place in real time. So in 20 years' time, I'm really hoping that we'll have thermometers that are practical that will do that for us. But we're really just at the start of that. So just really to come to an end now, come to an end of my talk. It's OK. I, 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 I can see the clock. I know lunch is coming, don't we? It's come to the end of my talk. We've come a very long way. Just imagine, at the end of the 1500s, we had no understanding of what temperature was, no understanding even how to measure it. We've come to know how to measure temperature. Uh, we've got rid of all those massive spurious amount of scales. We've got down to just one, uh, we've got down to just uh, those three scales. And then the fundamental temperature, the Kelvin, uh, was established. Uh, we worked out how to do a practical scale and how to make that practical scale useful for the users. And now, we're ultimately, we th I think we're going to give way to what's known as practical primary thermometry, which will give you a real temperatures based on fundamental physics in real time, direct to the Kelvin, over, over the lifetime of the process. So you have a nuclear waste store. You want to know its temperature for 10,000 years. No problem. Just put one of these thermometers in it. And you thought temperature, measuring temperature easy, didn't you? Now, now you know it's maybe not more easy than you think. Thank you very much. We start first there, and then we come, and then. Mm. Hi, thank you for an absolutely beautiful talk. Um, that was lovely. I'm going to have to go back to Florence. Um, <laughs> could you expand, uh, no pun intended, on, uh, on the argon thermometer, how it works? I don't have an immediate kind of intuition on whether the sound would go faster if it's hotter. On the origin of what, sorry? Uh, the, no, the, how the argon thermometer works. The, oh, the argon thermometer. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, so and why does it take a week? Is that multiple measurements, or does the measurement take a week? Oh, why does it take a week? It just takes that, that long to... You want it to become 
isothermal. So you want the whole resonator, it's about this big, and you want that to become isothermal, so you want it to become completely uniform in temperature. Okay, uh, and to do that, it just takes a long time. Okay. Um, and then you need to change the pressure, and then wait for it to come to te that temperature again. They need to change the pressure, you need to change the pressure, you need to wait for it to come back. And it just takes a long time, that does. Uh, measuring the speed of sound, well, just the, if you think about um, the, just the speed of sound um, in air is a function of temperature. So you can use that, you can just change, if you, change, if you measure the speed that it takes for, for a, a sound signal to go through air, you can, and you can then use that to infer the temperature of the air. So if you know the speed of sound, for instance, of, in, of, of um, if you need the speed of sound in air, you can tell how far away a lightning storm is from you because you can hear the difference between the lightning and the, and the actual crack of thunder. So you can actually tell how far away it is if you know the speed of sound in air. International temperature scale standard uh, set up in 1927. Mm -hmm. Where was that done, and how many countries agreed oh, to it? Very, very good question. Very good question. Um, so it's a very interesting question because although um, the UK didn't really adopt metric until the 1970s, we, were, we signed the Meter Convention in 1884, and actually the, the, the UK uh, was was very instrumental, and the French were very instrumental in actually establishing the, to the first temperature scale. They were the main players in doing that. And, okay, so, okay, this is a big question, right? So, okay, so I'll try not to say take time, but so in, in 1875, uh, there was a, the signing of the Meter Convention, uh, and that meant that the number of nations came together to say, we're going to adopt the SI units uh, as our units. And, so the, uh, and they set up an institute uh, called the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in Sèvres, in, just outside Paris, in, just outside Paris, uh, and that's where that work was, was, was originally done. Interestingly, the US was an original signatory. So the US has been metric since 1875, in principle. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, I'm just interested in um, the redefinition of, of uh, the Kelvin in, in sure. 2019. Um, so the, the Boltzmann constant is, it's not a dimensionless constant, so no. presumably that means um, it, it could be any number, it just depends yeah. on how you're measuring yeah. it. So the choice to sort of fix the Boltzmann constant as some number, I mean, that probably comes from, in order, to, in order to find that value, that comes from a temperature me measurement. So in a way, you sort of fixed it in place as a result of the original temperature scale <coughs> devised from the boiling point of water, et cetera. So, um, yeah, is, is no, no, that just, right? I'm, I'm just agreeing with you, yeah, yeah. that's fine, yeah. <laughs> um, so, we, so, you, you would uh, start in a different place. If, 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 you were do, if you knew all what we know now, you would do it differently, but you know, there's just too much embedded history to really change it. Got it. So, it's sort of the the the, the fixed uh, sort of nature of it comes still from the boiling point of water and the freezing point of water. Those are those are the sort of that's the fundamental well, the fixed the point. Trip, but it actually comes from the triple point of water. But yeah, it, it is from a fixed point because because it's based on the the absolute scale, the Kelvin scale, which is based on the triple point of water and zero Kelvin. And so, but but it is it is your right. It's based on the, that basically. Okay, it's interesting, thank you. I mean, in essence, in essence, uh, this, this is the admission that temperature is, is not a fundamental, temperature doesn't need a fundamental unit. It's really a mechanical phenomenon through thermodynamics, you can understand it through you know, the motion of, of, of gas molecules and uh, r really, meter, kilogram, and second are, are the fundamental players here. You have a certain fixed number for the Boltzmann constant, or you could say, if, if for the R, you could say a certain fixed number for the R, which is it could just equivalent, be one. It could and, just be one. and, and yeah. that's it, right? Yeah. That's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a fundamental unit anymore. Con well, conventionally, conventionally, it is refit, recalibrated, so that it coincides with past measurements and past habits. But it's not a fundamental unit anymore. 
meter no, no, kilogram and second. It's, 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 it's just, you know, it's just a form of energy, essentially. Yeah, it's not even, it's, it's not even a form. Energy is the fundamental quantity, always. Yeah, it's just a convenient way of measuring, of, of mentioning it, that's all. Yeah, energy is the fundamental thing. Is oh, hi. Thank you very much. Um, just a comment, really, was that um, there's another thermodynamic property which is essential for the science of living things, and that's entropy, and that living things are trying to minimize their increase in entropy or even reduce it. Um, uh, so what, what, do you want me to make a comment? So, about so yes. It, was there any, did you have any thoughts on, on entropy oh. with, res with respect to entropy? <laughs> 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 that's a, that's a, that's a, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. I just, uh, another thing was that um, Erwin Schrodinger, the, the founder of the, the Schrodinger's Wave Equation, he wrote a book called What is Life? And that was all about how living things are trying to minimize their, their entropy increase. Yeah, so well, yeah, I mean, they used to call, the, the, and they used to call entropy wasted energy in, in the early, early days of that because because basically when you do the <clears throat> in a steam engine or, or or an internal combustion engine it's never completely reversible right yes, a, exactly. a, a carnot cycle is reversible so is, is effectively reversible so you go around the cycle the piston goes up the, uh, the um, fuel the end, heat causes it to go down and goes up again the carnot cycle is reversible there is no energy is lost in that but of course in reality uh, some is yes, lost so that's the lost energy or or, or or entropy effectively yeah. And it's minimizing that loss of entropy, maximizing the efficiency of the engine. Or, or you could put it a more prosaic way. When you look at your teenage son's bedroom and, then, and, and they've tidied it up, no, maybe you've tidied it up. And then a few days later, you look back, you see entropy in life, don't you? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you very much, Jim. No matter how much work you do. <laughs> <laughs> Entropy also increases. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm an engineer, and I use thermocouples all the time. Excellent. And, um, the, best, the best and simplest tensors are thermocouples. Yeah, indeed. I, I'm just wondering if you have any comment on, on, on their reliability. Um, you know. Lots. I've written papers about it. Marvellous. You just go to my research gate page and you'll find dozens of papers. Yes, because I, my understanding is that, um, yeah, at a fundamental level, they are reliable. Their calibration. You need, uh, they need to be calibrated, of course. Yeah. Um, and depends on what you do with them. I mean, I've seen people use them as steps in a, in a, fa in a factory, which and they were wondering why their thermocouples weren't working properly anymore. There, there's a ladder. They thought it was a ladder going up the wall, right? And um, the engineers were supposed to go round, 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 and up these, but it was too quick, so they went up these, these funny wiry things, and they found out they were the thermocouples <laughs> that were controlling the foundry. <laughs> uh, and and um, the strain that they were putting on the wires were causing strange, yeah. strange effects. So you've got, so you got to be careful with your thermocouples. Um, Thank you. But if, but if you've got... I have to say, if you've got specific questions about thermocouples, please feel free to email me, and I'll, and I'll be very happy to, to uh, have a discussion about it. Thank you. It, it, temperature is unlike any other physical uh, variables, and uh, you did a fascinating job on uh, showing how it was conceptualized, uh, but it, you didn't cover at all uh, how it was perceived and how it was perceptualized. I wonder if you can throw some light uh, to prior oh, okay. thinking about it. Okay, okay. Uh, and yeah. when the term uh, temperature was coined. Mm. Probably not some of those things, but some of them. The temperature is very strange temperature, isn't it? Because you can have, um, like this glass surface I've got in front of me, if I put my hand on it, it feels cold. But this wooden surface next to me, if I put my hand on it, it feels warm. But they're both at the same temperature. So perceptually, it's actually very difficult to really understand what temp to measure temperature or assess temperature without something objective. I think what 
one of my colleagues said in the talk earlier about iron glowing. That was very interesting. You know, so when you get to higher temperatures and iron metal glows, then that's certainly used to determine temperatures. And in the past, in, in iron foundries, the foundry man used to have a piece of orange peel of a particular colour, and he used to pull it out. And he used to look and compare his orange peel to the iron temperature. And when he knew that when it got to the colour of the orange peel, it was right and ready to take to the hammering. So that was a, that, he wouldn't touch it, of course. He'd be a bit hot, <laughs> but he'd use that. Uh, and that principle was actually used as well for a long time as well. But it's very difficult because your perception is deceptive, isn't it, with temperature? Yeah. And we have a last question. Yeah. Th thank you very much for <clears throat> a wonderful talk on the history of measuring temperature. But may I ask you to say a little bit about what temperature is? Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I think at one stage you may, I think I heard you correctly saying it's the quantity of heat. And I'm sure you don't mean that. No. Because heat is not a thermodynamic variable. Proportional. Yeah. So what is temperature? Temperature, is, temperature I, it's really molecular motion, isn't it? So it's a description of molecular motion. So in this room, which is, I don't know, 22 or 3 degrees Celsius, or 300, maybe 20, 293 Kelvin, let's do a sensible unit. So, uh, so basically, that is that temperature because of all the, the motion of all the atoms, the gas atoms that are in it, and the average velocity is related, the average velocity of those particles is related to, sorry, the temperature is related to the average velocity of those particles, and that's really what temperature is. It gives you a, a measure of the velocity squared, thank you, yes, the velocity squared of those particles, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's motion, effectively. It's energy of motion. Thank you. Thank you.